the dawn's light will shine again. So long as we have these specious accusations hanging over us, we will struggle to achieve anything. You must go to Ishgard, as Tataru proposed. I will return to Uldar and set things right. Pray, do not be so hasty, Master Elfino. Lord Orshafon. Full well do I understand your desire to clear your names. But now is not the time for drastic action. You yet have allies upon whom you can rely. There is no need to act alone. Yes. Yes, of course. Pray forgive my impatience. I bring tidings. Count Edmont has decreed that the three of you be taken in as wards of House Fort Arm. Under our patronage, you shall be granted access to the city proper. Pray, consider our manor your new headquarters, from which you may gather information and plan how best to proceed. Needless to say, should any of your missing allies be found, as I am certain they shall, they will, of course, be welcome to join you there. You are more than generous, my friend. On behalf of my fellows, I humbly accept your offer of hospitality. The Count is a good man, and just. He will treat you with the kindness and respect that a hero and dear friend deserves. To Ishgard then, together. There we shall carry on the Scion's legacy. There we shall begin anew. So they came, at a friend's behest. Heroes, once celebrated as saviors of Eorzea, brought low through treachery, their names blackened with royal blood. With memories of the lost and dreams of redemption, with hope yet in their hearts, they came. To Ishgard, shining city on the mount, overlooking the dominion of Kurthus. A great and proud nation, devoted to Halone, the Fury, ruled by Thordin VII, Archbishop of the Ishgardian Orthodox Church. The last bastion of the faith her walls ever bristling with the sworn swords and spears of her four high houses. A land that after a thousand years of war had forgotten what it was to be at peace.
Through gates long closed, the warrior of light and her companions passed, entering at last a city whose history was written in blood. In the midst of the Dragonsong War they came, three weary travelers whose arrival would set in motion great change. Though none knew then how great. My lord, I have returned with the Scions. I hope your journey was not too taxing. I, Count Edmond de Fortomp, do bid you welcome. As wards of House Fortom, you shall be afforded every courtesy. My home is your home. My companions and I are deeply honored, Count Fortin. The honor is mine, Master Alfino. Consider it an expression of our gratitude for your service to Ishgard. Forgive me, my lord, but... Are you not concerned? To accept foreign guests at such a juncture, especially ones with our reputation. Do not worry yourself on my account. Tis true that Ishgard's first thought has ever been the war effort, hence the closing of our borders. Yet it is in troubled times most of all that men should seek allies, don't you think? Granted, my decision will have raised eyebrows in the vault and in the halls of the other high houses. But so long as you continue with your altruistic endeavors, I doubt my honored peers will feel moved to voice their concerns. Then there is naught to fear. Though our numbers are much reduced, we are no less determined to carry on our work. Full glad am I to hear it. Uh, but before you return to your labors, why not take a tour of the city? You would do well, I think, to acquaint yourselves with your new surroundings. After all, you may be here for some time. To the frozen wastes of the Western Highlands, once verdant tracts made pallid by the calamity. Beyond the towering wall of ice, to lands long forsaken that the Knights of Ishgard strove tirelessly to reclaim. To the hamlet of Falcon's Nest, once abandoned, now freed of its pall of snow and ash, she came.
Looking for me, I presume? The child who glimpsed the truth. No! It cannot be. She cameth unto me, as didst thou. Alike in gifts, yet set upon different paths. He speaks true, warrior of light. Like you, I have been blessed with the echo. The visions terrified me at first. They came without warning. I wondered what I had done to deserve them. But I had no time to ponder such things, once the calamity came. The land turned against us. And in a matter of hours, Falcon's Nest was buried under ten fulms of ice and snow. We had no choice but to flee for Ishgard. We came to the wall, and while we searched for a way through, there was an avalanche. And then I was alone. So I set forth for Dravania. I knew full well what might happen where I found but I could not survive on my own. I was found, of course, and not by a mere dragon, but by the great worm Hreisvalga. And it was then that I knew why I had been given this gift, for with it I heard his voice and saw the truth through his eyes. I was chosen to deliver this revelation to the people, to bring dragon and man together as they once were and should ever be. It wasn't supposed to be like that. You have to believe me. It was beyond my control. Children taught to fear the skies who saw their loved ones slaughtered. Yet the Dravanians, though they know where the fault truly lies, fell upon them with such fury. Men die, and their children forget. But we are everlasting. To us, then is as now. Thou canst not comprehend the violation, the outrage, the fury. I will make this bright. I am neither a saint nor a savior, just another sinner. Yet I will not forsake this cause. I cannot. I will see this cycle broken, and peace restored. I... We can do naught else, for we are now as one. Upon an airship, conceived within the fecund mind of Sid Garland, renegade prodigy of Garlemald, who had come to call Eorzea home.
High into the heavens, where isles of earth and stone floated as clouds, a frontier the knights of Ishgard had scarce begun to explore. To a fledgling outpost, within the sea of clouds, where careworn scouts ever scanned the skies for winged shadows, she came. Reinforcements? Anger of Honu! Chief of Mighty Vondo! Royals like blackest storm clouds! Offer netherlings to the white! Cloud sea swells and he comes! The White! Mighty Bismarck! Lord of the Mists! A flying whale? By the fury, it's a primal! We must away! Bloody typical. All right, we're going in. Aye, 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 aye chief. chief. All aboard. The hero returns. I cannot thank you enough for saving young Emanolaine's life. Aye, aye, he told me everything. I've also received letters from both House Zemile and Durandere praising your conduct and that of House Fortong. You've won as much honor, my friend. My lord. What is it? Speak. Pray forgive the intrusion, my lord, but I, I bring grave tidings. Master Alfano and Mistress Tataru have been detained on suspicion of fermenting heresy. What? Explain. They, uh, they were observed entering a tavern in the lower levels. 
on some half dozen occasions. There, it is claimed, they made a number of inquiries. Inquiries which brought them into contact with certain, um, elements. It was this which prompted a Knight of the Heavens War to demand that they be questioned. Sir Grino, my lord. Sir Grino is a brute. An exceedingly accomplished brute, but a brute nonetheless. Alas, he is also a son of House Zamayo. How quickly we forget the petty nature of men. I'd wager your friends are no more than pawns in another of my countrymen's games. Such is the way of things between the High Houses. We are gathered here today under the watchful gaze of the Fury to ascertain the guilt of two souls in a trial by combat. Petitioners, step forward. Sir Grino, for the benefit of all here present, I would ask you to repeat the charges which you have leveled against this man and this woman. I, Sir Grino de Zemile, brother of the Heaven's Ward, did bear witness to these two foreigners consorting with heretics. Let the accused step forward. Alfino Leveilleur, Tataru Taru, you have heard the charges leveled against you. Will you take up arms to refute Sir Grino's claim and thereby prove your innocence in the eyes of gods and men? I, Alfino Leveilleur, am innocent of this charge and claim my right to trial by combat. I, Tataru Taru, am innocent of this charge. But I am no warrior and cannot fight. So I claim the right to name a champion. To the old and the infirm, the young and the weak, this right we allow. Very well. Who will stand for this woman? Just as I was beginning to doubt the efficacy of the Ishgardian justice system. Come, my friend. Let us put an end to this mama's farce. Render unto us your judgment. Raise up the righteous and cast down the wicked. Your Eminence, it is my honor to present to you the Warrior of Light.
I have heard the tales of your many grand endeavors. The Lord Commander has also been most effusive in his praise. I am Thordon VII, Archbishop of the Ishgardian Orthodox Church, and I bade you come here that I might offer my personal apologies. You will forgive me for not calling upon you as courtesy would dictate, but as you can see, my more sprightly days are long behind me. But I digress. Your companions were wrongly accused of heresy and subjected to gross indignities. This, I am sorry to say, was the result of negligence on the part of our nation's protectors. Negligence born of an excess of zeal. Is that not so, Sir Zephyrin? Yes, Your Eminence. Regrettably, it would appear that we of the Heaven's Ward were in receipt of erroneous information. Sir Grino has ever been headstrong. He pressed charges before the truth had been ascertained, for which I most sincerely apologize. An unfortunate misunderstanding born of an earnest desire to serve Ishgard, but one which should never have occurred. For who could doubt the character of those who bested Shiva and drove the Horde from the Steps of Faith? Not I, that much is certain. That will be all, Sir Zephyrin. I would speak with our guest in private. Your Eminence, I... As you wish, Your Eminence. That will be all for today. Privacy is a luxury rarely afforded one in my position. Now tell me, young lady, what do you know of the Asians? Much and more, I shouldn't wonder, being the bringer of light. You should know that I myself have met with them, have entertained them as guests, even. Those harbingers of chaos and strife offered us power that we might continue our war against the dragons. I have no intention of aiding their cause, of course, nor less of being their puppet. Yet, were I to refuse them outright, I should learn naught of their true objectives and remain powerless to stop them. Thus have I hearkened to their words with interest and paid lip service to their beliefs, biding my time and preparing for the inevitable conflict. And why do I tell you this? Because there is naught in this world they fear more than the power of the Warrior of Light. If we are to rid ourselves of these vile interlopers, we must need to work together. With our combined strength, I have faith that we can wrest Eorzea from their grasp and pave the way for a lasting peace. Think on it. There you are! I confess, I was more than a little concerned when I learned that you had been summoned to the Vault. 
What did they want with you? Well, well. A formal apology and an admonishment of those responsible. I see my fears were wholly misplaced. By the gods! The Archbishop freely admits to consorting with Assians. So, their ambitions extend to Ishgard as well. We will have new primals to contend with ere long, of that you may be certain. Tis but a matter of time. Yet shorn of the support of our missing allies, what can we realistically hope to achieve? <gasps> In the midst of all the excitement, I completely forgot to tell you. When I was asking around about the Scions, I heard the most awful rumour. General Raubun is to be executed for crimes against the Sultanate! If the Flame General dies, we will lose a staunch ally and the one man capable of holding the Sultana's assassins to account. Lord Orshifon was wise to counsel restraint, but this business will brook no delay. We cannot permit this execution to take place. We must save Raoban. Friends, it is good to see you safe and well. I will admit I had not counted on you seeking, let alone finding refuge within the Holy See, but full glad was I to learn that you had. Thankfully, we had allies there who took us under their wing, and theirs was not the only aid we receive, I suspect. When we fled Uldar, we fully expected to become wanted men, known to all and hounded at every turn. Yet that did not come to pass. On the contrary, it would seem the charges against us have not been made public. Might we have you to thank for that, Admiral? Sharp as ever, Master Elfino. On Marshal Terrapin's urging, the Elder Seed Seer and I demanded that the Syndicate suppress news of the Scion's alleged crimes until such time as irrefutable evidence could be found. Our argument was simple. Lacking proof to accuse the saviors of the realm of so unlikely a crime would have the people up in arms. In their wisdom, the Syndicate agreed, as you yourself have seen. There is something you should know. Some few days prior to the banquet, the Elder Seedseer and I were summoned for a private audience with the Sultana. There, she revealed her intent to announce her abdication, that she might pave the way for the establishment of an Uldan Republic. What? But such an announcement would have plunged the entire nation into chaos. She was well aware of that. It was for fear of what might ensue that she summoned us. Her grace wanted the elder Seed Seer and I to lend Raubarn a helping hand, you see? to aid him in preserving the peace during the transition. So, having somehow caught wind of her plan, Lollarito and Teleji plotted the Sultana's assassination in the hope of maintaining the constitutional status quo. But they must have known that her death would sow as much chaos as her abdication. Chaos from which Teleji alone might feasibly stand to profit. Surely Lollarito would never knowingly Ah, could it be? I dare not hope. The Uldan authorities have yet to announce the Sultana's passing. To allay any suspicion that may arise from Her Grace's absence, they have issued a statement to the effect that she is presently convalescing from illness. Mayhap they're waiting for a fitting moment to break the news. Or mayhap they know of some other reason to delay. 
something else has been bothering me, Admiral. I was dismayed to learn that General Rauban is to be executed. Yet upon hearing the news, I could not help but wonder why he had been kept alive for so long. Pray mistake not my meaning. I am, of course, overjoyed that our friend still draws breath, and that he might yet be saved. But if his enemies truly wish to eliminate him, they could have done so immediately. I see no reason for this delay. Aye, you've struck upon an important point, Master Alphano. Following his capture, Rauban had been held in the Marasaja pit within Uldar. In recent days, however, he has reportedly been moved to an unknown location. Queerly, it was not the Brass Blades who spirited him away either, but a band of soldiers decked in blue. The Crystal Braves. Aye. If I read the winds aright, the arrangement between Lord Lollorito and the Braves has come under strain. At any rate, if we're to rescue Rauban, we'll have to find him first. And you'll be glad to hear that I have already entrusted the task to those best able to see it done. Our friends of Doma. Pray, forgive me my lateness. Lady Yugiri! Master Alphano, I am pleased to see that the light of resolve shines in your eyes once more. Ah, yes. How pathetic I must have seemed to you when we last met. I am ashamed to recall it. For a time I was well and truly lost. But with the aid of my comrades, I have since refound my purpose and I shall take care not to misplace it again. Since your escape from Ulda, my fellow Shinobi and I have shadowed the Crystal Braves every step, in hopes of learning the Scion's whereabouts. Regrettably, our investigation has yet to yield any useful information. Pray, forgive us. You need not apologize, my lady. We are grateful for all that you have done on our behalf. Besides, Ralban is no less a friend, and we cannot well abandon him to his fate. Hosan, the three of us shall attend to the Flame General's rescue. Pray, draw away the guards by the entrance. Take Doware and Higiri with you. <laughs> with me! This changes nothing. It is over, Elbird. Lay down your arms and surrender yourself to justice. Justice? Justice for what exactly? Twas not I who assassinated the Sultana, boy. Ere we debate who is responsible for the assassination, I would ask whether an assassination took place at all. Oh, clever little shite. If you think you fight for justice, lass, you best wake up. The truth is, you fight for whoever bloody well tells you to. Can you not see you're being used by the Scions, the city-states, even the Crystal Braves? They none of them care a whit what you want, only what you can do for them. And how do I know this? Because I'm the same. A pawn to be used as my masters see fit. All I ever wanted was to liberate my homeland. And I ate dirt to make it happen. But what have I achieved after all these years in servitude? Nothing. Not a bloody thing. Thank you. 
If we ourselves are not free, free to think and to act, how are we ever to reclaim our homeland? Know this. There is nothing I would not give to take back Alamigo. Nothing! You'll not get away! No, Master Alphano. Now is not the time. I'm but a cripple and a fool. And still you came for me. I'm in your debt. We are all of us fools of fate, General. But even fools have a part to play. Rest assured, I was not planning to die till I'd avenged the Sultana. Still, your words are welcome, lass. Know this, Ilbert. There is nothing I would not give to see you pay for what you've done. My wealth, my arm, my life, nothing. General, are you aware that Lord Lollorito has yet to announce the Sultana's death to the public? What? No. No, I was not aware of that, nor of anything else outside my cell. Tis passing strange, though. I assumed the bastard would make it known at the first opportunity and set about tearing down the Sultanate. As did we all. And it is indeed strange that he did not. Strange, or perhaps revealing. Now, I have no conclusive proof, nor do I wish to give you false hope, but I have reason to believe that her grace may yet live. What? But how can that be? Forgive me, friends, but it is not safe here. Let us continue this conversation without... My dearest friends, praise be unto the Twelve for delivering you from the clutches of treachery. Pippin, my son, and Master Papashan besides. Forgive me, Father. I should have been at Her Grace's side. Save your tears. The Sultana yet lives. You. It was I who arranged this gathering. And judging by your perplexed expressions, it would seem introductions are in order. I am Dulala, head of the Order of Noldthor, and member of the Syndicate. What you said about the Sultana, is it true? Is she alive? Young lady, I understand you were with the Sultana when she drank from the poisoned goblet and collapsed. Would I be correct in assuming that you did not personally verify Her Grace's vital signs? Why ask when tis playing? You know the answer. Calm yourself, General, and let me finish. The truth is not as you imagine it. You are all victims of a most ingenious ruse. A ruse conceived to eliminate the threat posed by Telegi Adelegi. Tis my belief that Telegi plotted the Sultana's assassination alone, but that Lollorito caught wind of his plot 
and exploited it to his own ends. He sought to manipulate you into eliminating Telechi for him, and you duly obliged. At one fell swoop, he removed his two foremost rivals, all the while remaining above suspicion. God strike me down for a fool. But the Sultana, how can it be that she lives? She lives because Lolorito willed it. Her own lady-in-waiting is but one of his many little birds. By her sleight of hand, the poison was switched for a less deadly draught before it could reach her mistress's lips. Some manner of sedative, perchance, of a potency sufficient to induce a slumber like unto death. Were I to guess, I would say her grace is being held somewhere, dreaming dreams of a brighter Ulda, even as we speak. Oh, Nana Mo! I will never forgive Lolorito for his part in this! Though Lolorito's hands are far from clean, they did pluck her grace from the jaws of death. That must count for something. And though one may call the man's methods into question, it cannot be denied that he knows the value of stability, to the very gill like as not. He craves power, tis true, but he has no desire to depose the Sultana. I had never taken sides in your feud with the monetarists, but it was not for want of concern for our nation's welfare. Indeed, t'was out of the desire to see order restored that I furnished your Far Eastern friends with information and arranged this gathering. I hope you are ready to work, General, for there is much work to be done. Our first priority must be to bring matters back into balance. Lest you forget Her Grace's words, the true wealth of Uldar lies in the health, happiness and hopes of her people. As for the more worldly kind of wealth, I am content to let Lolorito help himself to whatever Telegi Adelegi left behind. You, meanwhile, must do that which you alone can do. Rescue her grace and take your place at her side once more, for her sake and that of our nation. Ishgard cannot well endure another assault. Even should her knights succeed in turning back the Horde, the casualties will be catastrophic. But what other choice do we have? It's not like we can talk it over with them. Dragons and men aren't exactly on speaking terms. With certain notable exceptions. You don't mean Ice Heart? When last you spoke with her, she lamented her crimes, did she not? Then there remains a sliver of hope. If we can persuade Ice Heart to act as our intermediary, we may yet be able to convince Nidhogg to abandon his bloody course. If there is to be a meeting, I would accompany you. Estinian. Even with your intermediary, Nidhogg's blood rage may render him deaf to reason. However, the mere attempt may afford our forces precious time to prepare. Of course, you might also consider a more direct approach to ending this conflict. 
With the power of the eye at my disposal, and the vaunted strength of the Warrior of Light, we could conceivably slay the beast outright. If we are to risk a face-to-face -face meeting with the Dread Worm, I for one would feel safer in the company of the Azure Dragoon. However, I should only turn to your lance if my words failed to find their mark. Is that clear? Perfectly. I shall assume that Isart enjoys similar diplomatic protection until instructed otherwise. A word of advice. Think carefully before divulging the particulars of this plan to Sir Emmerich. T'would not do to have the Lord Commander accused of consorting with heretics. Indeed. I thank you for your counsel, Estinian. We shall be honoured to have you with us. I am glad to be of service. I want the defences of the Outer Ward rechecked. See to it that the ballistas are in good repair and supplied with enough ammunition for a prolonged siege. At once, my lord. Ah, to see my have visitors, and unlike those messing beyond our walls, these ones are welcome. Pray forgive us for interrupting you in the midst of your preparations, Sir Emmerich, but our suit concerns the impending assault. To speak plain, we believe there is a chance the invasion might be halted before it even begins. I can divulge a little more at this time, but I must nevertheless request that you advise the Holy See to refrain from launching any preemptive sorties whilst we seek to put our plans in motion. I will gladly lend my support to any endeavour that could spare the blood of my countrymen, but I would know more of the cause you would have me champion. Will you not share aught of this mysterious undertaking? Know that I have offered my lance to aid in this endeavour. I cannot claim that its success is assured, but our actions should serve to delay Nidhogg's advance at the very least. Which is more than can be said for the ill-conceived counter-attack advocated by the sea's more vocal crusaders. They offer glorious death, but little hope of victory. Aye, their proposal does not inspire confidence. Our resources should rightly be spent shoring up the city's defences. Hmm... The Azure Dragoon and the Warrior of Light sallying forth together to face the Dread Worm Nidhogg. I must admit the mere thought of it does much to dispel my misgivings. Go then, carry out your plan. I shall do what I can for you within the Holy See. Such commotion. Yes, Your Eminence. The bells of the Observatorium warn of our enemy's approach. So, the dragons are coming. Let them come, in their hundreds and their thousands. With the Divine Blade in our hands, we shall rend their flesh and drown the heretics in their master's blood. Even Nidhogg and his foul brood shall be powerless to resist us. And when we have rid the world of their pestilence, we shall turn our attention to our Asian allies. See that they are suitably rewarded for their invaluable assistance. 
If I may, Your Eminence, the Paragons wield powers strange and unknowable. Can we be certain that they will not see through our deception? We can be certain of naught save the righteousness of our cause. If you would be a true leader of men, you must possess conviction as well as caution. We seek to excise the root of an evil that has blighted us for a thousand years. The risk is worth the reward. And what of Estinian and this warrior of light? They have plans of their own. Leave them to their purpose. We must each play the role we have been given. You and your chosen brothers most of all. For the glory of King Thordon. Ah, I should have known it would be you. Word reached me of a struggle with a small but well-armed band of trespassers. Forgive my comrades their hostility. Few come here uninvited, and fewer still with good intent. Now, tell me why you are here. So, you seek to stem the Dravanian tide with talk, a romantic notion. If you but knew the truth, the spark which lit the flames of this animosity, you would understand the futility of your quest. Shall I relate it to you? The sordid history my gift has shown me, that which the Holy See has taken such pains to suppress. was more than a millennium past when an Elizan tribe first sought to claim the lands of Kurthas as its home. Unfortunately for them, Kurthas was already home to dragonkind, and they were not inclined to make way for the invaders. Thus did a bloody war begin, a war which might well have rumbled on until one or the other side was exterminated, had it not been for the resolve of a single woman. That woman's name was Shiva. While those around her fought and died, she attempted to parley with the dragons, and in so doing discovered them to be possessed of profound intelligence and reason. The great worm Horaisvelga in particular so enchanted Shiva that she found herself growing to love the creature whom her people considered a monster. In the eyes of a near immortal dragon, however, the fleeting life of an Elizan is as that of a freshly cut rose. Scarce has the flower bloomed before it begins to fade and wither. Such melancholy musings plagued Reisvelga, who had found in Shiva an unexpected and beloved soulmate. He knew that all too soon, death would snatch her away from him. Unable to bear the thought of their separation, the maid bid the worm consume her, that their spirits might be entwined for eternity. Though loath to perform the deed, Hraisvelga ultimately gave in to her plea, and soon thereafter the tale of their ill-fated love spread throughout the two warring factions. No more could they raise blade or claw against one another, knowing that the souls of their kin were so inextricably bound. In the days that followed, man and dragon learned to live in harmony, and together built a nation unlike any the world had ever known. 
For 200 years did this blissful age of peace continue, as it would to this day, had vilest envy not stirred in the hearts of the Elizin. It is said that worms owe their longevity to the boundless reserves of vitality found within their eyes. And twas in this belief that a traitorous band of knights deceived their allies of some two centuries, and took by force that which they coveted. Nidhogg, he who now stands poised to unleash his wormlings upon Ishgard, was the great dragon who lost an eye to Elizin treachery. And until he prizes it from the hands of the traitor's progeny, no amount of conciliatory words will stay his fury. You are wrong, Lady Iceheart. Lest you misunderstand, I do not doubt your vision of the past. Tis true that Nidhogg greatly desired to reclaim the Eye. Indeed, it was for that very reason that I kept it with me as I roamed the land, attempting to draw him away from the city. Good gods! Until recently, Nidhogg seemed unable to resist its allure and pursued me relentlessly. Needless to say, that is no longer the case. Now, it would seem, he has fixed his attention on Ishgard itself, though he knows full well the Eye does not reside there. You believe he targets the capital for another reason? I believe reason has all but left him. Through the eye, I feel much of what Nidhogg feels, and the dragon's thirst for vengeance will not be quenched by aught less than a sea of blood. If Nidhogg is indeed lost to reason, might we not seek an audience with Hreisvelger instead? He has thus far shown no inclination to aid in the invasion of Ishgard, and may yet welcome our efforts to broker a peace. You still believe that a peaceable solution can be found? Very well. I will take you to him. Our road will lead us to Dravania, the homeland of Dragonkind. There we shall ascend unto the clouds, where Hraesvulga resides. Is aught amiss, my friend? I sense the many battles are beginning to take their toll. Rest a while, and should you lose sight of us, Dravania lies beyond the mountains to the west. Curious. The vestiges of thy mistress's blessing are not as faint as once they were. Thy will to succeed grants thee 
Unusual fortitude. But will it be enough? Beyond Abalathia's spine, the great mountain range that spans the continent of Aldenard from east to west. Into the deepening shadows of Som Arl, where lies the ancient home of Dragonkind. To a land where the soil slithers and the sky seethe with sinuous shapes, they came. Vidofnia! Tis thee, little one. From above I did mistake thee for a nerf. Tis well I chanced to look again, or thou wouldst now be ash. Dear Vidofnir, how I have missed you. Would that I had come sooner, and not out of dire necessity. Thou art troubled. Speak that I might know thy plight. Thou wouldst have father admonish his brood brother. I would end this war without further bloodshed. How am I to believe thee, little one, when thine own companion beareth Nidhogg's stolen eye? Have care, dragon, or I shall gouge out one of yours. You forget yourself, sir. We are here on a mission of peace. My sires will forbiddeth me from inviting discord to our home. Tis for this reason and no other that thou still drawest breath, knight. Vidofnir, please. We must be allowed to convey our intentions to Resvalgar in person, with words of our own choosing. Grant us this favor, and open the way to Som Al. Thou hast ever been welcome, little one. But I cannot grant thy wish. I am bound to remain here, and protect my kin from the Nath's god. The Nath have summoned a primal! Pray excuse my forwardness, but if we were to eliminate the threat to your territory, would you consent to Lady Izzel's request? Ha! <laughs> Dost thou imagine thyself equal to the task? To succeed where dragons have failed? Tis beyond thee, mortal. But thou art welcome to try, nonetheless. Only know that idle promises shall avail thee naught. It would seem we have no choice but to make good on Alphino's offer. <sighs> Why must our every bid for peace breed yet more war?
Now we have but to wait. O oh Lord Ravana, Master of the Sacred Blades, Wrath of the Colony, Conqueror of the World, hear our prayer. Pray grant unto your devoted children the gift of your Divine Presence. He comes. strength to the colony. Speak and I shall listen. Oh glorious general, we have captured intruders and would make unto you an offering of their life's blood. These feeble fleshlings dared to invade Natlands. Hear me, Lord Ravana. My companion and I did not come to contest your children's territory. We wished only to learn the reason you wage war against the dragons. Thou wouldst flirt with death merely to satisfy thy curiosity. Wherefore should the glorious conquests of the Nath Concern thee so, Elizabeth. Ah, mayhap thine own kind struggle against the worms fareth poorly, and thou art desirous of a pact. We crave no alliance, Lord Ravana. Only peace. We would bring an end to our war with the dragons. Yet so long as they remain embroiled in this conflict with your children, our goal shall remain out of reach. Never before have the Nath risen up in such numbers, and never yet with you at their head. Why do you lead them to war? Thy question hath no meaning. To live is but to fight. Long have my children waited, gathering their strength in the shadow of thy ceaseless conflict. The Nath would see the Dravanians slain, and their territory secured, and by such fervent prayers am I now given form and purpose. As I feared, your very existence is an obstacle to our goal. Since you are so fond of fighting, we challenge you, Lord of the Nath. And should we emerge the victors, I would have you swear to withdraw your soldiers from Dravanian soil. Risk thy fleshy hide so readily! Very well. I, Ravana, 
fourfold master of the blade to accept thy challenge. But should I emerge the victor, I would have thee swear to serve in mine army till thy last breath is spent. Do you accept? I do. And I believe the first bout is mine. My lord, thou wilt not break thy word, I trust. Mine oath is unbending as steel, little goddess. Thy wounds will but add to mine enjoyment. myself stronger mayhap with more crystals be thou god or maid thou art nothing to me and what of thee mortal art thou warrior or craven
does the sacred right of combat proclaim the victor? I lay my blades at thy feet, child of man. You do not disappoint, warrior of light. Would that I had your skill in battle. I do begin to see why so many place their faith in you. For all his savagery, I do not think Ravana won to break his word. Provided the dragons do not trespass upon Nath lands, they should have little to fear of the primal's biting blades. We have done well. Have we not? Come, let us return to Vidofnir and share these glad tidings. Once more you achieve the impossible, bringer of light. But with every mortal heart that succumbs to fear and fury, Another voice is joined to the chorus, beseeching divine succor. At their bidding, warring gods will shake the firmament, and your world will be consumed in the swelling storm of chaos. To the peak of Som Al, at the end of a perilous mountain path, whence could be seen a string of pearl-like islands floating in possibly atop a sea of clouds. To a domain where dragons and men had once lived in harmony, whose majesty no mortal eye had glimpsed for nigh on a thousand years they came. Grace, Velga. S in arm and arm. Way more than By the twelve, my ears hear the tongue of dragons, yet the meaning rings clear within my mind. How can that be? Bracevelga, do you not remember me? Twas I whom you found in Dravania. I who glimpsed the truth. 
the truth about your past. About Shiva. But speak it I must. I have summoned Shiva's soul from the beyond and offered myself as her vessel. She has made her heart known to me. I have surrendered mine to her. Do you not see, my love? I am Shiva reborn. Then the spirit that answered me. Be that as it may, Lord Hraisvelga. Izel's desire to heal the rift between man and dragon is real, and it has borne us this far. We would spare both our kind and yours the ravages of this senseless war. Pray join your voice to ours in a call for peace and forgiveness. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Sifuni Ratatoska Nis Egg Ed For Always in Dar Kal Egg Mon Thorn En Yui Alei Fe In Leita Working Ushkin In Sun Hes Shis Nishka Your tale bears scant resemblance to the one I was taught. How convenient that it should absolve your kind of all responsibility. But tell me, dragon, why should I believe your version of events? Ishgard's so-called heretics. Then, the seed lies within us. Ye gods, I have borne witness to such a transformation. Looked on as a heretic assumed the shape of a dragon. I imagined it some manner of Dravanian enchantment. But if any Ishgardian, regardless of allegiance, has such potential within them, twelve forgive us to think of all the dragons we've slain. War Ulmon Alaan As Drago Kawul Smaim Korsu Thrahal Sesk Muni Se Ang In Kin Nizeg Oft have I wondered why Nidhogg did not simply raise Ishgard to the ground. Now I have my answer. He has no intention of winning the Dragonsong War, for it is no war at all. But vengeance, an eternal requiem sung for his murdered sister. In ice in Drago, ale I have not come this far only to admit defeat. We can still return the eye to Nidhogg and beg forgiveness for our ancestors' crimes. Mayhap our words will sway him.
Well, what do you propose we do now? I, for one, am intent on continuing to the east. What is there to be found in the east? Nidhogg's lair, the Airy, is said to lie in that direction. And the eye tells me he is near. You cannot still mean to slay him. You cannot still mean to stop me. I have been true to my word, and aided you in this fool's errand with Hraisvulga. But your efforts at Pali have come to naught, Lady Iceheart. I would see Ishgard saved, and for that, Nidhogg must die. With the tale of our ancestors' vile betrayal yet ringing in your ears, you speak of continuing this war? Nay, lady, I would but pierce its vengeful heart. When Nidhogg dies, this war shall die with him. A moment, Astinian. You yourself spoke of the Great Worm's strength, that you believed him powerful enough to raise your city to the ground. How then are we few to challenge him? Even behind the stout walls of Ishgard, with an army of knights manning the defences, our victory would be hard won. Yet you propose to contend with the beast in his own lair. In close combat, this will afford us an advantage. And if the tales are true, the Warrior of Light has bested many an invincible foe. But such speculation is meaningless if we cannot even find the worm. Our first task must be to seek out Nidhogg's lair. The story of this nation grows bloodier by the moment. Must death always be answered with more of the same? Such is the way of things, I fear. I shall consider it a miracle if mine armor is not stained crimson ere this conflict is ended. I should be blinded by my own lies. Everything I believed. Everything I thought I was. Gone. All gone. Leave her. Your words will not reach her now. And we have not the time to wait for her to gather up the pieces of her shattered faith. Is that it? Aye, that would be the Airy. I feel Nidhogg's presence through the eye, his caustic hatred gnawing at my soul. Twould seem the death of his consort has put him on guard. Mark! How he wards his lair with tempestuous winds. A similar barrier once barred our entrance to the primal Garuda's domain, until we discovered the means by which it could be penetrated. Mayhap it is time we called upon Master Garland. 
will be just like the good old days, no? Feast your eyes upon our latest and greatest feat of engineering. We call it a mana cutter. After you put down Gaius, Wedge and me struck out on our own for a bit and started work on the successor to the tiny Bronco. Impressive little thing, isn't she? My talent for ship design has plainly rubbed off on them. They've adapted the principles of corrupted crystal technology and constructed a mechanism which converts ether from its surroundings into elemental wind. Said wind is then harnessed by the specially engineered sails, providing the craft with propulsion and lift. All in all, a most elegant solution. I'm actually a little upset that I didn't think of it myself. The design does, however, come with one small flaw. The energy conversion ratio is bloody awful. To generate enough power to get you off the ground, you need to be in an area awash with predominantly wind-aspected ether. In other words, there are a few places you can fly, and lots of places you can't. The new Ishgardian airship hasn't left the boys much time for tinkering, meaning it may be a while before this particular project takes off, if you'll forgive the pun. <sighs> Tataru, what's happened? been looking all over for you. There's been word from Alda. It's about Her Grace the Sultana. It seems you're required elsewhere. Leave the mana cutter with us. We'll see that she's airworthy and suitably equipped to slice through those winds. You, meanwhile, should concentrate on providing Raoban and the Sultana whatever help they need. Thank you for coming. No thanks are necessary, General. I trust your recuperation continues apace. I cannot complain. Thanks to Higiri and her ministrations, I've regained much of the strength I lost during my imprisonment. I gather you have made progress in the search for Her Grace. Aye, some good fortune at last. A few days past, Dulala informed us that a sizable shipment of alchemical supplies had been delivered to the palace. With Papa Shan's assistance, I set out to ascertain the source and nature of the shipment. My inquiries led me to Frondale's frontistry. There, I learned that an order had been placed for a curious substance designed to sustain patients trapped in death-like slumber. An invention of the former head alchemist, apparently. A death-like slumber? This cannot be a coincidence. It lends some weight to Dulala's claims, aye. Her grace is likely somewhere within the palace, a bed but alive. Before making any attempt to extricate the Sultana, however, it seemed prudent to learn what manner of substance was used to induce her torpor. To that end, I made inquiries as to the whereabouts of the one most like to have administered it, the lady-in-waiting, Meriel. 
We sent for you as soon as we learned of her location. All that remains is to apprehend the woman. We shall find our cat's paw in the Silver Bazaar. But we must tread carefully. The market is not the bustling place it once was, and someone is sure to mark our coming. Should they inform the monetarists, we'll have a fight on our hands. We must be prepared for the worst, and being short an arm, I thought it wise to take another in its stead. What say you, warrior of light? Will you lend me yours? Then I pity the bastard that stands in our way. Come, my friend, for Nanamo and for Ulda! You are Meriel, the Sultana's former lady-in-waiting? I know no one of that name. Pray excuse me. General Alden! Have the truth from you, girl. Mayhap it would be better coming from me. Lonorito, you'd best talk fast. As you know, Telegi Adelegi's Cartano Reclamation Bill was no more than a facade. A means to get his grubby little hands on that elegant monstrosity Omega. When he learned of Nanamo's intention to abdicate, however, he was forced to amend his plans. Suddenly, assassination seemed the most promising way to further his ambitions. I am told Telegi had discovered a maid in whose veins ran the blood of House Thorn, a new, more pliable puppet to sit the throne. Twould have caused an uproar, of course, but few could have contested her claim. Was plain that Telegi's wild machinations had outgrown our ability to control them. So I decided to usurp his scheme and left the fool to seal his own demise. And what of Nanamo? Oh, I have no desire to harm her grace. Twould profit me little to destabilize our government. Thus did I employ young Mariel here to administer a potent sleeping potion, in place of a poison. You should know, General, that your dear friend Ilbert was fully aware of my plan. I had him lie about the assassination as a means to prime your rage against Telegi. We weren't entirely sure how you would react, but things went rather better than expected. You conniving little worm! You had your claws in the Crystal Braves before their first recruit had sworn to serve! 
But of course, when a new game begins, it is only prudent to have a piece on the board. Illbird was mine. Truth told, a significant proportion of the Brave's initial endowment was also mine. With such large sums moving about, it was a rather trifling matter to disguise my own contribution. Ah, Ilbert. <laughs> I secured his services with a promise to support his cause once my authority had been solidified. I swear, the man thinks of naught but prizing Alamigo from the grasp of the Empire. Unlike you, General, the poor fellow seems quite unable to forsake the land of his forefathers. Mayhap, that's why he called you a traitor to your people and a disgrace to your homeland, amongst other things. What was it he always compared you to? Uh, oh, yes, an overgrown lapdog begging for scraps at the Sultana's table. <laughs> oh, how we laughed. Alas, Ilbird's entertaining little outbursts eventually gave way to wearisome tirades, and the zealous brute became rather unruly. I had no wish to see you executed, you understand, but he would not take no for an answer. Rest assured, his employment with me has long since ended. Which brings us neatly to the present. What say you, General? Both you and the Sultana are alive. We have one corpse and one fugitive. And preparations have been made to restore your good name. Shall we cry quits and start again with a blank ledger? Hmm? The hells we will! Do you honestly expect me to forgive and forget? After all you've done! You're guilty of high treason! Stay your blade, Master Alden. You yourself are not innocent. Or have you forgotten your own crime in executing Telegi Adelegi without trial? Though you acted out of loyalty to the Sultana, such deeds are in violation of both the word and spirit of the law. If you would, Lord Lollarito? This potion will wake the Sultana from her slumber. Consider it a gesture of conciliation. You will find her grace resting comfortably within her private chambers. Should you doubt my word, I shall willingly accompany you to the palace as your hostage. I like not your motives, Lollarito. But you saved the Sultana's life, and for that, you have my gratitude. Rauban Aldin. You are hereby reinstated as General of the Immortal Flames. The citizens of Uldar shall once more be united under Nanamo Ulnamo, and together we shall usher in a new age of prosperity.
I was having the longest dream. Tis time to wake up, Your Grace. Another day begins in Thanalan, and the sun blazes bright upon the sands. Her grace is awoken. The palace physician assures me she is none the worse for her slumber. I believe her grace will soon resume her plans to place the government of Uldar into the hands of its citizens. Whatever path she chooses to take, I shall walk it with her. And we shall tread slowly, lest the nation be unsettled in our wake. Her Grace's compassion is a shining beacon to us all. But what our city truly thrives upon is competition. It is in the struggle against our rivals that opportunities are seized and fortunes made. And with the Empire on the offensive once more, now would hardly seem the time to turn our system of government upon its head. Are you privy to new intelligence, my lord? I would hardly call it new. Remind me, what was the name of that enormous Imperial warship which met its end in Mordona? Oh, wait, I have it. The Agrius. Yes, well. Twould appear that the Galeans have been hard at work on another such vessel. How close are they to completing this ship? Is it operational? Its maiden flight was a success, I hear. I should imagine Emperor Varys is eager to see how it performs in battle. My lords and ladies, I move that it is time to repair the damage caused by Telegi Adelegi and prepare our great nation to repel the Empire once more. It is well that the Sultana has awoken. The Syndicate yet needs to put its house in order, but twould seem the worst of the confusion has passed. Uldar has taken control of its future, and I must do the same. I have decided to disband the Crystal Braves. Among the recruits, there were those who supported our Order's goals and convictions with all sincerity. Tis my hope that these loyal men and women will choose to remain our allies in the battles to come. As for those who sided with the traitor, Illbird, they shall be hunted down and held to account for their crimes. It is my earnest hope that they will surrender themselves peaceably when the time comes, though I think it unlikely. Ah, my all-conquering crystal braves. The model army meant to pave the way for a single unified grand company of Eorzea. That so high an ideal should be brought so low. I need not tell you how deeply the betrayal stung me. Yet I see now that it was mine own naivety and pride which allowed the Braves to fall prey to corruption.
as ever, it is to your own shining example that I turn for inspiration. Like you, I mean to stand firm in the face of hardship and give mine all for the cause. Let us resume the search for our missing comrades, that we might come together to shine the light of dawn across the realm once more. The role of Crystal Brave Commander suited me ill, and I shall play it no longer. Henceforth, I shall be no more or less than Alfino, proud member of the Scions. All stands ready, Lord Commander. Ah, the moment has come then. Pray excuse my lateness. I paid a brief visit to the workshop to inquire about the mana cutters. The engineers assure me that they're ready. The area is now but a short flight away. Yet what a long and winding path we took to reach this point. Were it not for Master Alphino's proposal, we never would have attempted to parley with the dragons. Though our negotiations yielded little, our expedition with Lady Isa taught us much. You took an unimaginable risk. I could scarce believe the tale Estinian told. Aye. It is true that many of our countrymen would sooner die than join hands with the heretic's mistress. But twas through that most unlikely of alliances that we came to speak with Reisvelgo. A conversation that went rather poorly, as I recall. In this instance, the journey was more important than the destination. Had we not slain Nidhogg's consort, Tiamun, and put the Great Worm on his guard, the Dravanians would have arrived at Ishgard's walls long ago. Aye, that they would. Full grateful am I for every hour of respite your actions have afforded us. Thanks to you, our defenses are much improved. Tis but a pity they won't be enough. Thus, you believe an assault upon the area represents the city's best chance of survival. Is that not so, Astinian? I am under no illusions. Nidhogg's might is legendary. But with his eye in my possession, I can stifle his strength at the source. Victory will be hard won, even so. And I shall be glad indeed to have the Warrior of Light at my side. You shall have my blade as well. There are more of these mana cutters to be had, yes? Lord Commander, no! How can I, a proud knight of Ishgard, stand by and do naught while an outsider risks life and limb for our homeland? I swore an oath to protect this city. Pray leave the slaying of dragons to dragoons, Sir Knight. Your duty to command the city's defense is no less vital. Should we fail, and Nidhogg slip through our grasp, who then will hold the walls against him? Will you leave Ishgard in the hands of the Holy See Zealots? There are others. Who but you has the authority and the standing to orchestrate a city-wide defense? I do not, and neither does the Warrior of Light. That is why it is our place to fight, and yours to remain here, Lord Commander. What? You too, Master Alfino. By the Fury. You have shown some promise, but this adversary is far beyond your skills. Your candor is appreciated, Sir Dragoon. I shall remain then and cheer you from afar. 
Well, my friend, it would seem I have discouraged the last of the volunteers and claimed the task as ours alone. But if any alive can best this worm, tis surely we too. You gifted my people a thousand years of suffering! Now I gift you an eternity in darkness.
They are ours, Lord Eldrath. The eyes of Nidhogg. Aye. The worm lies broken and my father is avenged. With the wellspring of his vitality thus denied him, Nidhogg shall not linger long in this world. But behold the terrible price we have paid. My sire is dead. So many brother knights slain. We traded our honor for the strength which now courses in our veins. And still we are forced to make such sacrifice. But not in vain, my lord. Trace Felger is the only great worm left in Dravania, and he dares not leave his lair. With Nidhogg's eyes in your possession, who now can challenge the might of Ishgard, ascend the throne, and take your rightful place as the ruler of our people? Nay, my friend. I must forsake the mantle of king. Though Nidhogg be defeated, his wormling horde yet darkens the skies with wings beyond counting. As one who partook of Ratatoska's strength, it shall be my penance to bear a knight's arms until death grants me leave to retire. When that day comes, no prince shall perish, but a hell's bound hunter of dragons. But Lord Haldreth, what then shall become of the royal line? Think of your people, my lord. Without a king, who will the common man turn to in his hour of need? How will he find his way without your benevolent hand to guide him? I thank you, Sir Flavian and Sir Silvertrill, for dispelling my remaining doubts. With men of such wisdom and compassion in service to the realm, it is plain that Ishgard has no need of a king. But if you must bow to the demands of tradition, you need look no further than yourselves for one worthy to wear the crown. Fare thee well, my brother knights, my loyal friends. On these shoulders shall I bear the weight of my father's sins. With this lance shall I repay the debt accrued through our misdeeds. What cruel jest has fate played upon us? Have we seized this desperate victory only to lose a king? We can but act as our lord has bid. We few who remain must divide between us the rulership of Ishgard and her people. Not I. My oath was to Lord Haldrath and he alone. If he is not to be king, then I would hang up my shield as well. Will you abandon us too, sir? I would wash my hands of blood and betrayal and take up an honest trade. Mayhap I shall serve ale instead of sharp and steel. We four, then. Fortan, Hylanat, Dirinder, and Zemile. 
but four houses to rule all of Ishgard. And what of the throne? We keep it empty. Until the day a king rises once more, we must assume the role of stewards. We shall shape our nation anew with a history of our own making, and let the truth of this dark day die here, upon the battlefield. What ails you, friend? Are you wounded? You have borne witness to history. To the culmination of the first battle with Nidhogg. The legend of Ishgard's founding tells that our ancestors were led to the land of Kurthus by the valiant King Thordon. In the midst of their journey, they came to a wide chasm, where they were set upon by a great worm, Nidhogg. A furious battle then ensued, with Thordon leading the van. Though the brave king was slain defending his people, his son, Haldrath, the first Azure Dragoon, fought on undaunted. And with a mighty thrust of his lance, he gouged out Nidhogg's eye, forcing the wicked creature into retreat. Thus, did this eldritch orb become a sacred treasure of Ishgard, lending its power to every knight deemed worthy to bear the title of Azure Dragoon. A rousing tale, is it not? Would that I could still believe it. But your vision, which we must accept as immutable truth, leaves no room for doubt, save on one point. If Haldrath took both of Nidhogg's eyes, then how came this eye to be lodged in the worm's skull? Beneath every answer we unearth, another question lies buried. Twas a fierce battle. But one I knew we would win. Your fame is well deserved, warrior of light. Full proud am I to have fought at your side. I would fain return with all swiftness to Ishgard to inform the Lord Commander of our triumph. But we must first have words with Hreisvelger. There are parts of this tale that the worm has kept from us, and I would know wherefore.
You mean the moment I prized your eye from his head? Has he or lay to our make as set me like an as an straw of an? Es easy an ihm. It was yours. Your strength that sustained Nidhogg all these years. Would that Haldreth had dealt the worm a killing blow. 
Acquiesced. You surrendered your eye to Nidhogg, knowing full well the suffering he would inflict. This one son in in Ela. Was my life's goal to slay Nidhogg. But I find there is little joy to be had in its accomplishment. But you have rid the world of a hate filled creature, and ended a bloody war in so doing. I lost my family to Nidhogg's flames, and was with fury in my heart that I took up the lance. Every blow I struck, I struck in the name of vengeance. We were not so different, he and I. I will not judge you for your deeds. I have not the right. Too many innocents have perished in the name of my greater good. Yet even with all that has passed, the tale is incomplete. We are short a great worm's eye. Of the pair which Haldreth took from Nidhogg, only one is known to us, the one I bear. What then became of the other? Why did Nidhogg, who had taken such pains to prolong the Dragonsong War, suddenly decide to hurl his entire army against the walls of Ishgard? Lord Commander, Aye. The deed is done. Nidhogg is slain. What? In the city? A battle with whom? At once, Lord Commander. Hold firm till our return. Fighting has broken out in the city. Lord Emmerich was sparse with the particulars, but it seems some commoners threw open the gates to a force of heretics. I gave no order to attack. Are we to mark the end of the Dragon Song War by spilling the blood of our own? Mayhap Raisvulga was right about us. Let us away, Warrior of Light. The people must be saved from themselves. Wait! I would join you! There has been enough violence. I will appeal to my people in the city and make them see reason. Come then, Lady Iceheart. Let us write the final chapter in this damnable war.
A small army of heretics has invaded the city, your eminence. But there is no cause for concern. A sizable contingent of our soldiers is already in place to repel the Dravanian assault. And the intruders will soon find themselves outnumbered and outmatched. Our plans proceed apace, then? Yes, your eminence. This unrest shall serve to feed the people's fear of the heretics and the dragons both. And lend renewed fervor to their prayers for deliverance. Very good. Grant our guests what time they need to sow a measure of chaos, then order the Temple Knights to crush them. Your will be done. The moment is at hand. Excellent. All shall soon be in alignment. It is time for the bringer of light to die. Swords! There is no need for further bloodshed! My lady! She is come! Hear me, brothers and sisters! The war is ended! Nidhogg is no more! Aye, it is so! This adventurer and the Azure Dragoon laid the Great Worm low! <clears throat> the endless cycle of violence between man and dragon was born of our forefathers' treachery. You have followed me, bled with me, to bring this truth to light that we might all know peace. But Nidhogg is dead. Nidhogg is dead, my friends. He who bore such hatred towards Ishgard is dead. Let his hatred die with him, I say. Let us sheath our swords and go in peace! Have we lost? No, my friend. Far from it. At long last, the peace for which we have so desperately fought is within our grasp. And I, for one, would not forsake it. Peace?
Seize the witch! Let none escape! Providing aid and succor to the wounded should be our first concern. If the heretics mean to observe the peace, then it would be folly not to do the same. Praise Halone, you are safe. My safety was never in doubt, Father, for I had the Azure Dragoon and the Warrior of Light by my side. We bring the most wonderful tidings. The infamous Lady Iceheart, here in Ishgard? This is most unexpected. She has done much to quell the violence. The Inquisition may not approve, but we are glad of her presence. And with the Great Worm's demise, even our nation's more reactionary elements will have scant grounds to press for her immediate impeachment. My thoughts exactly. What of the truth revealed to us by Schreisvelger? That the origins of the Dragonsong War, a core tenet of Ishgardian faith, are quite unlike those depicted in the scriptures. That men and dragons once lived together in harmony, and that it was man's treachery which shattered the peace and plunged our peoples into war. The same scripture also describes the origins of the High Houses. Were it exposed as false, the legitimacy of our rule would be called into question. If both Highborn and Lowborn can trace their ancestry to Thorden and his Knights Twelve. But a single sip of Dragon's blood is required to confirm their lineage. If the Holy See knew of this and chose to remain silent, their crimes are grievous indeed. Regardless, this state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. Sir Emmerich, you cannot mean to raise this matter with the Archbishop. Pray consider what you are proposing. If the Holy See chose to conceal the truth for centuries, what reason would they have to reveal it now? At best, you will be branded a heretic and clapped in irons. Then at least the Archbishop will have shown his true colors. My friends, this war will never truly be at an end until the truth is made known. You must see what lies on the horizon if it is not. When ruled by fear of a common enemy, we were united. But now we have none. During the war, the Highborn needed men to lead, and the Lowborn men to follow. Not anymore. Tis but a matter of time before the old order is called into question. Lady Iceheart will share the truth with her followers, and the Holy See will be powerless to stop its spread. The disenfranchised will rise up united, and blood will flow in the streets once more. A divided Ishgard will not survive. Tread carefully, Lord Commander. My lady, is it wise to let him go? I sympathize with the Lord Commander's desire for reform. But to approach the Archbishop in this manner bespeaks an idealism to which I did not think Sir Emmerich prone. Though he comports himself as a realist, he has long dreamt of reform. To 
was that idealism which first drew me to him. That which made me swear an oath to serve. We must not think of ways to hinder his cause, but rather ways to aid it. Even should the Holy See cry heresy. You cannot mean... If the Lord Commander does not return from the vault at the appointed hour, I mean to go and fetch him. Have care, my lady. Your words border on treason. Should they reach the wrong ears, you will be declared an enemy of Ishgard. That is a risk I am willing to take. Lest you forget, my lord, I am not born of this land. My loyalty is to the Lord Commander alone. But I speak only of what may come to pass. If the rumors regarding his heritage are to be believed, we have naught to fear. <laughs> Lies and slander. Forgive me, what rumors are these? That Sir Emmerich is the Archbishop's bastard son. Senior clergy are not permitted to marry and sire children. But even the holiest among us are not immune to temptation. I labor to believe it. Sir Emmerich is truly the Archbishop's son. He has never been publicly acknowledged as such. But the rumors have plagued him since childhood. That he rose to his current position, despite being despised as a bastard and accused of profiting from his father's influence, bespeaks the quality of his character. It is my hope that on this occasion, the burden of his birth will work in his favor. Should our worst fears be realized, the Archbishop will not be so quick to execute his own flesh and blood, affording us time to mount a rescue. Bastard or trueborn, he is our nation's best hope. If the Holy See dares to threaten him, I shall lead the charge against the Vault myself. Hear, hear! The future of Ishgard rests on Sir Emmerich's shoulders. I too will do mine utmost to aid his cause. Orshafon, be reasonable. A knight lives to serve, father. To aid those in need. The people need Sir Emmerich more than ever, and we may be his only hope. There is no greater calling for a knight than to save the life of his fellow man. I swear to you, on the sigil of our house, that I shall do this and make you proud. Even you? Romantic, reckless fools, the lot of you. So be it. Make your preparations. I thank you all for your support. Where do you think you're going, Missy? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend. What's going on here? What's it to you, boy? Piss off. Hold on. I've seen them around. They're in and out of House Four Tom's Manor all the time. Oh, I see. Skulking about at your highborn master's bidding, eh? Bloodhounds hoping to catch a whiff of heresy, is that it? You are quite mistaken, I assure you. We came here to help. And if you know what's good for you, you will let us pass. Ha <laughs> ha! Listen to the pups yapping. Come here, boy. I'll give you cause to yelp. Enough! Leave threatening women and children to our betters. We don't have the knack. Hilda!
Lay a finger on the blue blood's pups, and you're like to lose the hand. In often I get called on by glorious heroes like yourself. So tell me, what have I done to deserve you? So, while you're on your way to kill Nidhogg, you stumbled on some dirty secrets that the Holy See has been hiding for centuries. Eh? What are they on about? The High Houses. And what makes a nobleman so bleeding noble? They trace their blood back to King Thorden and his Knights Twelve, the founders of Ishgard. But our friends here reckon we're all descended from the heroes of Eld. Highborn and lowborn alike. And so Sir Emmerich, Lord Commander of the Temple Knights, has gone to ask the Archbishop if he wouldn't mind letting everyone know. Is he simple? The old bastard will have him executed for heresy. Well... Seems to me that's what the good sir wants. Seems he thinks a noble sacrifice will serve to prove his claims. We cannot stand idly by and allow Sir Emmerich to do this. Ishgard has need of him. Look, you've a good heart, I can see that. Willing to risk your neck for someone else even when his troubles ain't yours. But what's this got to do with me? If Sir Emmerich is imprisoned in the vault, we will need all the help we can muster to breach their defences and rescue him. What in the hells?! Ah, the unmistakable scent of heresy. And what do we have here? The honored guests of House for Tom consorting with the Queen of Rats. Plotting insurrection, I shouldn't wonder. That won't do. Sickness is wont to fester and spread. It must be burnt out ere the infection takes hold. I reckon Sir would be happy to wield the irons himself. Well, so happens. I've got irons of my own. Such simple creatures, rats, certain to attack when cornered. Let us step outside, milady. In here, your toys could hurt someone.
There's no denying your gifts. A well-deserved reputation indeed. Enough! Lucky bastard. Nay, tis we who are lucky. Had we fought on, t'was but a matter of time before our conflict claimed the life of an innocent bystander. I thought the Heaven's Ward might come here as well. They came to the Temple Knight's headquarters. Aye. Sir Grinnow announced that the Lord Commander had been imprisoned under suspicion of heresy, and that the Heaven's Ward had been granted full authority in his stead. Then the Heaven's Ward now commands the Temple Knights. Those still loyal to Sir Emmerich answer to me. Alas, that amounts to but half our number. The other half, who opposed his promotion to Lord Commander, have gathered at the Vault as ordered. Bolster in the guard already, eh? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were expected. I take it you're in charge around here? Hilda, and yes. The young master was just persuading me to join his lost cause. Convincing little beggar, isn't he? I, your passion moved me. A bit. That, and the fact that we're sick of living off the leavings of our betters. If you've a mind to change things around here, then we've a mind to join you. How can this be? Hold back! my friend. Why must you do this, father? Nidhogg is fallen. There is no need for further deception. Now is the time to renounce the lies which led us down this path. To start anew! And tear down the very pillars of our society? Our history? Our values? Everything we have built over a thousand years? <sighs> a fool to the last.
Go. Asisla awaits. Lord Orshafon! You... you are unharmed. F forgive me. I could not bear the thought of... of... Oh, do not look at me so. A smile better suits a hero. Don't. Please. A knight lives to serve, to protect, to sacrifice. There is no greater calling. Leave me to mourn and give chase. For my son and for the nation he loved. Go! His sacrifice shall not be forgotten. Bye. My friends, I am in your debt. Think nothing of it. Your wounds are healing well, I trust. Some wounds do not heal. The Founding. The Scriptures, a thousand years of lies, all to deceive the common man. Nay, our own brothers and sisters. For the blood of the Knights Twelve flows within all our veins. You knew this to be true. You knew, and you concealed it. I should be interested to hear how you came by this knowledge. But yes, you have the right of it. The architects of Ishgard, King Thorden and his knights twelve, entrapped and butchered the great worm, Ratatosker, that they might partake of her eyes and thereby transcend their mortal limits. Upon learning of their treachery, Nidhogg was consumed with a murderous and justified rage. I dare say you know what followed. The Great Worm slew the King and half of his knights. Aye, but Nidhogg was subdued, 
and his eyes plucked from their sockets by the knights that remained. Their one mistake was to show mercy, for from his brother Hreisvelger did Nidhogg receive a new eye, thus rejuvenating his form and empowering him to embark upon an eternal quest for vengeance. Whilst Thordan's son Haldreth took one of Nidhogg's eyes and learned to wield its power in defense of his people. Thus was the first Azure Dragoon born, and ever since that time, his honored successors have risen to drive Nidhogg from our lands whenever the worm has returned to plague us. I ask you, my son, will you answer for my sins? Will your son and his son answer for me as well? What do you mean? If a man cannot atone for his sins in the course of his all too fleeting life, must his progeny then be held to account? Must every subsequent generation be judged as well? Thorin's betrayal of Ratatoska was an unconscionable, unforgivable sin. Should we then, as his descendants, meekly surrender ourselves to an eternity of punishment? Nay, say I, I would not see our children sacrificed in a vain attempt to appease an implacable foe. Dragons are not like us, my son. To they who live forever, the wrongs of antiquity are as those of yesterday. No reparations shall ever suffice. This fact alone should serve as ample justification for our actions. Yet some refuse to see it as such. For men like you, who yearn to commit themselves to a nobler cause, a more compelling narrative is required. This is your solution. This is how you protect our people. You have given us a lost cause, a death sentence, with your compelling narrative. You but doom our countrymen to give their lives for a lie. And they do so gladly. Highborn and lowborn alike are proud to serve, to fight and die for their country. And what would you say to them? What would you tell the wives who have lost their husbands? The mothers who have lost their sons? That their loved ones died for naught? I... Uh... Over the course of a thousand years, countless men have donned these robes, and every one of them came to accept the necessity of this solution. Once, I hoped you might come to accept it as well. Do not despair, my son. Soon I shall free us from the sins of antiquity and bring about the change you so fervently desire. If he has spoken with others, I would have their names. Escort him to a cell and question him. Thoroughly. Your Eminence. You saw something, did you not? A vision of the past?
So this is the power of the Echo. Would that it had shown you a finer moment from my past. Twas an exercise in futility, as you saw. Faced with the firmity of his conviction and his many ready rejoinders, my words deserted me. To be frank, I am embarrassed to recall it. A friend once impressed upon me the importance of differentiating between words, deeds, and beliefs. Were he here, I suspect he would judge your father's conviction to be no more than rank, self-serving delusion. Even so, I cannot help but wonder what manner of change he intends to bring about. I have given some thought to that as well. During the battle within the vault, the Heaven's Ward demonstrated strange and unnatural abilities. Aye, the manner in which Sir Zephyrin struck down Lord Horshafon was unlike anything I've ever seen before. The spectacle called to mind King Thordon and his Knights Twelve as they are depicted in scripture, holy powers and all. Mere fabrications which have become objects of faith, instilled with the belief of countless devoted souls. Seven hells! If Lady Iceheart can use her own body as a vessel for summoning, I see no reason why others could not. Are the Heaven's Ward truly so reckless? Unbelievable. As they fled, my father spoke of Aziz La. Though I know not what he intends, I fear no good shall come of it. His ambitions are too great, and his minions too powerful. We must find the Heaven's Ward and stop my father before it is too late. to the northern reaches of the Sea of Clouds, where countless isles yet remained uncharted. In search of a mysterious land known as Azizla and the unmasked villain who sought to claim its secrets. Oblivious to the new threat which followed in their wake, they came.
warrior light, beloved Adolin, all made Darkness, like to none known. Hark, receive a blessing small. So falls the Lord of Mists, as did all others before him. How many times does this make, warrior of light? Ah, how much you have grown, far beyond the limits of mere mortals. She has what we seek. That she does, the key to Azisla and the secrets of Alag. I see you have regained the blessing of light, albeit at a fraction of its former strength. My thanks to you, Asian, and to you as well, Warrior of Light, for saving us the effort of slaying Bismarck. Now that the key is within our grasp, the path to the heavens shall at last be laid bare. By our deeds shall the wrongs of antiquity be righted, and man reclaim the reins of history. Wait, something is amiss.
Imperial troops. And they have already secured the area. Reveal yourselves at once! And there I was, expecting more beastmen. Who are you? I thought his guardians responsible for the disappearance of our scouts, but I see now that I was mistaken. Just as Wire observed. The Warrior of Light is wont to appear at the most inopportune times. The Warrior of Light? She who bested Van Baelsar? It would seem that the famous hero of Eosia seeks Aziz Lar as well. Hardly unexpected. The secrets of the Alagans' power to bind icons to their will could scarcely fail to interest the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. You know as well as we what will ensue should these insatiable creatures be allowed to roam free. That their very existence threatens the life of this star. We but disagree on the solution to the problem. Genocide has ever been the Empire's favored recourse. And that is why we will continue to oppose your every attempt to claim Eorzea! You do not hesitate to speak your mind, even when your every word could be your last. Alas, your sentiments betray the narrowness of your view. The fate of Eorzea and its inhabitants is of little concern next to the fate of the world. Tis my solemn charge as Emperor to bring the Icons to heal. If this requires the extermination of certain elements, then so be it. No, don't! They are not his thralls! Where did that come from? Take cover! Your Radiance, we must withdraw. We shall meet again, warrior of light. On that you have my word. So Garlemald too has designs on Azislar. But why would the Emperor himself elect to lead the expedition?
I did not think that I would ever have occasion to pilot a suit of Magitek armor again. Least of all under these circumstances. My full name is Lucia Go Junius, and I was born a citizen of Garlemald. That explains it. When we first met in Ishgard, I very nearly called you Livia. Livia? Livia Sasjunius? The tribunus who served under Gaius van Baelsar? Aye, she was my sister. Though we spent little time together. After our parents were killed in an uprising, we were sent to live in different households, setting us on separate paths. Livia felt at home on the battlefield and chose to become a soldier, while I underwent training to become a spy. Then... Ishgard was... My mission. It was believed that Alagan relics of great worth were stored in the vault, and I was sent to investigate. Though I was given little information at the time, I now suspect I was searching for the key we but recently lost. And then I met Sir Emmerich. It was his usefulness to my mission which prompted me to approach him. But I soon found myself drawn to him for other reasons. He too was a prisoner of his past, judged for his heritage as a bastard son of the Archbishop. Yet unlike my sister and I, he did not curse his fate. He simply rose above it. In time, I came to realize that I had found a man worth following, and a new home besides. And when I subsequently confessed all to Sir Emmerich, he was good enough to accept me into his service. I do not question your loyalty to Sir Emmerich. It is your loyalty to your sister which concerns me. I have long been of the opinion that those who dwell in the past risk losing sight of their future. My sister fought for her convictions and for those she held dear. So do I. So must we all. Well, I for one am happy to welcome a fellow Galian to our merry band. Especially one who can make Magitek armor sing. Chief, we should be getting close. Once we break through those clouds, we'll be right where the light was pointing. Right where Azizla should be. Hold on, everyone! I think that's it! Chief... Is that...? Alagon... Aye... There's no mistaking their handiwork. What was that? Some sort of barrier. She won't hold, Chief! She's breaking up! I've lost the auxiliary propeller! Sid, it's no use! We must return to Ishgard and find another way! God 
Damn it all! Why do the Alagans always have to make everything so bloody complicated? In summary, the Isle owes its lofty position to the industry of the Alagans. And we can be all but certain that the Archbishop and his cronies are enjoying the view from its top. I see. If we are to join them, we will first need to pass through the Isle's etheric barrier, which is, alas, more powerful than most. Powerful enough to make a mess of a perfectly good airship at any rate. As far as I can gather, the barrier mechanism draws ether from the surrounding environment and polarizes its elemental aspect to produce what is, in effect, a wall of lightning. It seems plain that without the Vanu's key, any attempt to reach the Isle will end in failure. Alas, the key was careless enough to leave without us, and I don't think the Vanu keep a spare. Master Garland, based on your experience, is there no other way that we might breach the barrier? Well, in the past, we've beaten similar barriers by nullifying them with elemental converters. But the one we're up against this time dwarfs all that we've encountered before. The Enterprise simply isn't large enough to bear the requisite amount of crystals. I am reminded of the quantity needed to nullify Leviathan's command of the sea. A veritable mountain of crystals that could only be borne by lashing two galleons together to form a twin vessel, scarcely able to propel itself, much less fly. That said, we're not without options. If it isn't feasible to nullify the barrier, we might try piercing it. How? We create a ram of condensed ether and mount it on my ship. There's just one problem. I don't have the faintest idea how to build one. It's going to take a true authority in the field, I reckon. Would that the Archons were still with us. But yesterday evening, I chanced to find Mistress Tataru in unusually high spirits. Assuming I understood her excited ramblings correctly, she has acquired a clue, pointing to the whereabouts of one such individual. An Archon? Truly? Ha! Fortune favors the righteous, eh? Well then, let's not waste any time. While you go and look for our missing friend, I'll work on modifying the Enterprise. Her hull will need reinforcing to bear the punishment, not to mention a mount for the ramp. Just you wait, my pretty. By the time I'm finished, you'll be an airship reborn. In requesting the Elemental's assistance to find your Stola, you must needs be aware of one difficulty. A difficulty born of the fundamental difference between man and Elemental. 
that being? In perceiving the world around him, man relies upon senses such as sight and sound. For the sake of convenience, he gives names to such things as are near or dear to him. Being formed of pure ether, however, such concepts are foreign to the elementals. Instead, they perceive by observing the ebb and flow of the energies of life. So profound a division cannot be bridged with simple discourse. The elementals' voices stir not the air, and thus reach not our ears, while our words are but wind to them. Though we seers can commune with them through feelings, naught that we can impart will serve to aid them in identifying Yishtola. Nay, they must needs be presented with ether which is akin to hers. If you could but find a family member. Oh! I know just the person! Yishtola has a sister who came to live in Gradania. She told me about her once. Oh, that is most fortunate indeed. Pray, seek this sister out then and bring her to Evershade. There, we shall petition the Great One's aid in finding your lost companion. Let us begin. Raya O, Arun, if you would. Hearken to me, O oh Great Ones. Pray give yourselves to the life stream, a drifting soul to find. Please, Yishtola, please come back to us. There. Now!
A room has been readied at the roost. Pray, bear her thither at once. All that remains is to pray, my friends. Tataru. <laughs> you are safe. Thank the Twelve. Something has changed about you, Elphino. Or mayhap the change is with me. I seem to sense the ether around me more keenly than before. I am pleased to see you well again. Do you feel strong enough to talk? Worry not. I am well enough. Tell us then, what befell you after you fled the feast? We were told that there had been a tunnel collapse. That was my doing. I brought the tunnel down that you and Minfidia might escape. At the last moment, I invoked a teleportation magic, in hopes of spiriting Thancred away at least. Needless to say, it did not go quite as planned, and I found myself adrift in the life stream. The others? Where are they? Did they not escape? They remain unaccounted for. You were the only one we have been able to find. I am truly sorry. It was the Crystal Braves who pursued you that day. My hubris that led to our undoing. No apologies are necessary, Alpha No. You are not to blame for what occurred. Know that were our comrades here, they would commend you for keeping the light of hope alive. Don't... don't worry. The others are alive and well, I'm sure of it. We just need to find them. Indeed, Tataru. Let us find our friends and rebuild the Scions. Ha! There is the Alpha No I remember. And I feel much the better for his return. Tis time I arose. <gasps> that reminds me! I have a change of clothes for you! I don't like to boast, but I made them myself. I learned how to weave while we're in Ishgard, you see?
Tataru has apprised me of all that took place in the aftermath of the assassination plot. It would seem I have been away for some while. Yes, much and more happened during your absence. At present, we seek to follow the Archbishop to Azisla. And you want for some manner of etheric ram to pierce the floating isle's protective barrier? We do. Might you be able to furnish us with one? A means to prise open a hole in an Alagarn barrier. And one large enough to admit an airship, no less. Hmm. Nay. I lack the knowledge to devise such a weapon. But I know of one who could. A leading figure in the field of etheric research, and one of the finest scholars ever to grace Charlian. Matoya, my former master. To the Thaliac River, where to the melted snows of Abalathia's spine eventually find their way by means of a thousand silver streams. Whose waters have long nourished the Travanian hinterlands, and so provided for a settlement of learned souls from across the northern seas. To the city of Charlian, that great seat of knowledge, now abandoned by her keepers, they came. You know it's rude to enter without knocking. <laughs> the use of today. No manners at all. Though we neglected to knock, we did create something of a commotion. I had hoped that would suffice. Heavy-handed as ever, I see. And still not a hint of grace. Some things never change. To give credit where credit is due, I learned from the best. It has been too long, Master Matoya. Indeed it has. Oh, it's good to see you again, my girl. And with your fiery spirit unquenched. But look at you, all grown up and womanly. The one there in the fancy duds, that's Louis Soir's granddaughter, I take it? <clears throat> Grandson, begging your pardons. You knew my grandfather, my lady. Knew him? Ha! We were constantly at each other's throats. Like rabid dogs we were. <laughs> oh, he was a stubborn bugger, was your grandfather. <laughs> Never a dull moment when he was around, though I'll give him that. As for you, boy, I've known you since you were a rosy-cheeked babe at the teat. And my sister too, I gather. May I say what an honor it is to meet you again, my lady? Spare me the hollow pleasantries, boy. I'll wager my remaining good teeth you didn't come to a forgotten corner of Eorzea to flirt with a wrinkly old woman. Now out with it. What is it you need of me? Ah. 
Aziz La. I never thought I'd hear that name again. You are familiar with it. As familiar as one can get from poring over musty old tomes. The Alagon set the Isle afloat not long before the sun set on their empire. Old Louis Soir and I often talked about it. The place is home to a research facility dedicated to finding ways of mastering mighty beings, such as primals and dragons, and find ways it did to frightening ones. Such secrets as lie buried on Azizla aren't fit to see the light of day. And now you tell me a band of dragon-beating primal botherers are trying to dig them up? Indeed. And to make matters worse, the Asians have a hand in their plot. They must be stopped, no matter the cost. I see. Very well. You will help us then? Truly? I had not anticipated such an impassioned response. Could it be that the presence of young blood has stirred your own? Ah, some things never change. One day that pertness is going to cost you your tail, my girl. Don't say I didn't warn you. It was some um, fifty years ago, shortly after Garlemald had brought all of Ilzabad under its rule. Faced with a threat of invasion, the people of Charlayan scrambled about for a means to resist the Empire. For my part, I was tasked with developing an etheric converger. Ah, yes. A device which draws in ether and concentrates it to produce a destructive force. But as my research neared its end, it was denounced by the Forum, who claimed that my device was more likely to destroy us than our enemies. After that, they and I had a little falling out, and I decided to seal away all the fruits of my research, lest the dunder-headed ingrates reap any benefit. <laughs> Petty, I know, but gods. It was satisfying. Do mine ears deceive? T'was you, was it not, who were so fond of saying that all knowledge exists to advance mankind, that how it is used depends on us? I don't remember. Perhaps. All right, yes. It was a pet phrase of mine. And that should give you a notion of how sick and tired I was of those spineless wretches of the Forum. All talk and no trousers, that lot. That's why I decided to remain behind, rather than join the Exodus. You may have had your disagreements with my grandfather, but upon that point, your minds were as one. With respect, Master. The fruits of your research should not be left to spoil. Will you share with us the secrets of the Etheric Converger? Aye, I will. All the information you need is contained in a tome I wrote on the subject. But you'll have to fetch it from the forbidden section of the Great Library. Ah, oh, you were not exaggerating when you said that you had sealed it away. Though the city is abandoned, the library's guardians are all but certain to remain. We must needs cut a path through them. Come, let us away. Not so fast, you lot. Stoll and the boy are staying with me. I need help to make new sentinels to replace the old ones you walloped. There'll be board and lodging, 
Don't you worry. But know that you'll have to work for them. Hard. I'll have no sluggards in my house. I had not thought to behold this tome again. There! It is deciphered. Now your friends should be able to make sense of the contents. That said, is one thing to understand the workings of the Etheric Converger, and another to actually make it work. You do realize how much ether is required. Sid is keenly aware of the energy dilemma. His airship is by no means large, and it can only bear a limited quantity of crystals. If only we had white orosite in the Etheric Siphon. Alas, Minfilia is missing along with both artifacts, and Moonbreeder is gone. Would that there were another ready wellspring of energy for us to draw upon. <gasps> Why did it not occur to us before? We already have what we need! The Eye! It has been drawing ether into itself for as long as the Great Worms have lived! It is a veritable wellspring of energy! Hmm. It might just suit our needs. But is this energy something that can be harnessed at will? I believe so. With the aid of the Azure Dragoon of Ishgard. Then it is settled. Let us return to the Holy See at once. Stola, wait. When did the light fade from your eyes? I might have known that it would not escape your notice. It has been this way since I returned from the life stream. An after effect of the teleportation magic I invoked, most like. They are called forbidden spells for a reason. What were you thinking, girl? I have no regrets. I but did what was necessary to preserve the light of hope, to keep my promise to Minfilia. Besides, it afforded me the rare opportunity to wander the ether, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I need not tell you that it consumes your very life force to see by sensing the ether around you. Take care of yourself. Do you hear me? I will, Master Matoya. And thank you.
Until but recently, the Ishgardians had kept their doors firmly shut to outsiders. But thanks to you, we have found in them stout allies with whom we may fight to secure the future of the realm. Truly, you are the beacon of hope towards which all men are drawn. Spare us the hyperbole. Tis not for praise that we fight. Oh? In light of all we have achieved, I felt it only meet to express my gratitude. All that we have achieved? <laughs> Spoken like a true outsider. Until the war is over, we have achieved nothing. The coming battle is a chance to excise the root of this conflict, and by my hand it shall be done. Then you may speak of achievement. T'was not mine intent to make light of your struggle. If I have given offence, then I apologise. But if I may speak freely, you would do well to be wary of the eye. Even now it burns with insatiable hatred, watching unblinking for a sign of weakness. Should you falter for so much as a moment, it will surely consume you. Save your concern. I will consume the eye ere I let it consume me. Twelve be praised, thou hast not yet set forth. Across sand and snow have I journeyed, that I might deliver this gift unto thee. White Aurasite, but whence did it come? To mine amazement it lay hid amongst Moonbreeder's last effects. Twas but blind chance or providence that I did hap to spy it. Let no man claim that my late friend Eyre erred for lack of foresight. In the place whither thou goest, servants of darkness do lie in wait. Pray, give unto me thy pledge that thou wilt strike them down and avenge our fallen comrade. Ah, excellent timing. We've just finished our work on the Enterprise. She's so much improved, I've decided to give her a new name to suit. The Enterprise Excelsior. Or simply the Excelsior, if pressed for time. Once again, she'll carry Eorzea's protectors into battle. I can do no more than see you off with prayers for your safety and success. Yet know that wheresoever you may go, my son's spirit goes with you. May the fury grant you strength. Return to us, all of you. Enterprise Excelsior, engage.
This is it! Get ready! I of mine enemy, render unto me thy power! No, you will not claim me. I am the master. Chief, we've got an Imperial battleship on our tail, and it's bleeding massive! Damn it! The bastards were waiting for us to open the door for them! I'm gonna try to shake them. Hang on to something. Ooh, we're all going to die! Tataru! She won't take much more of this! The time is come to use Heidlin's gift. Much blood has been spilled in my name. And for what? For a false cause that I created for want of the warmth of companionship. Saint Shiva, pray Svelga. Pray forgive this fool. But even now, I cannot let go of my dream. My dream of a tomorrow in which no child need freeze alone in the snow. Thank you, Race Velga. <gasps> Is that Azel? What does she mean to do? Oh God.
goddess born of mine own hopes and dreams, for the last time, I beseech you. Fill this vessel with your light, still the hatred within our hearts, and bless us with eternal grace! Farewell, warrior of light, and thank you for showing me the way. No! This ether, it was a crystal of light. She, too, was one of Heidelin's chosen. Fare you well, my lady. Our objective lies at the heart of the Isle. The third will remain to guard the ship, while the second patrols the perimeter and eliminates any threats. The first will come with me to secure the research facility.
Let no man doubt the import of our mission. The Alagans found a means to capture icons alive, and their knowledge lies hid upon this isle. If we can but acquire it, we would be able to prevent the beings from returning to plague us, thus ending the cycle of rebirth. I need not remind you that success will raise our legion high in the Emperor's regard. Yet, by the same token, his radiance does not tolerate failure. That is all. All troops, prepare for deployment! So that is their purpose. To think that the knowledge used to bind no lesser being than Bahamut sleeps here. Imprisoning a primal in such a manner would represent an effective means to halt the cycle of summoning, were it not for the grave and obvious risks. Indeed. We need but refer to past experience that of Bahamut's calamitous return to see why this is not the solution we seek. Held in duress, a primal will continue to nurse its hatred for mankind. And when it inevitably breaks free, its rage will be beyond quelling. Whatever folly the Garleans mean to commit, they can wait. We must remain focused on our task. Yes, of course. It would not be polite to keep the Archbishop waiting. That would explain my men's silence. We meet again, and this time we will not be interrupted. Come! Show me your power, champions of Eorzea! I had heard the tales of your strength, warrior of light, and now that I have experienced it firsthand, Van Baelsar's defeat seems less inexplicable. You are a formidable foe, and I have thoroughly enjoyed our time together. Alas, all good things must come to an end. Alagan's secrets await, and there is no profit to be had in remaining here. them occupied.
It would seem we have no choice. You must continue on. We will hold them here. Take the eye. It should still hold enough energy to be of use to you. I shall join you as soon as I am able. Enough talk! Make haste and stop the Archbishop!
Nesgesk Nysin, Seth Alan E. Ekmon, Way E. Er In. Sale Anya, N. Esh E. In Esh O. Esh Ed In. Warrior of Light, beloved daughter, the light abideth within thy heart again. Full valiantly didst thou overcome thy many trials, but glory not in thy success. For the servants of darkness are ever close at hand. Receive of me my blessing once more. And go forth to shine thy light on all creation. Thou hast broken down the wall I built around thee, and partaken of thy mistress's blessing once more. Strong art thou, mortal, stronger than any other of thy kind. Having looked upon thy deeds, I am convinced. Thou art worthy to bear her light. The Covenant bound me to thee, but would seem our fates were mingled from the first. Though I will not fight thy battles, I will yet lend thee my wings. Out the darkness.
The champion of Hydaelyn. Tell me, why do you despise the primals so? They are the embodiment of mortal will, of mortal desire. Plainly, you desire a foe to despise, and tis well that you do, for it is from the vortex of ceaseless conflict that Lord Zodiac shall be reborn. Through the joining, the world shall become whole again. Then all shall be as once it was, as it should ever have remained. For the glory of Lord Zodiac. Your meddling ends here and now, warrior of light. Such strength, it defies all reason. No, I will not be bested by the likes of them. La Habrea, it is time. Very well. Let us show these mortals the true power of the Echo. The power to break down the barriers of existence. become you. And we are become one. that she might regain the blessing of light I had foreseen. But she has grown so strong in it as to deny us our power. Let us withdraw, La Habrea. That power remains to us, at least. So, you harness the eye's power. A 
pity you spent it all. What will you do now, hero? So, not even the vaunted warrior of light can unmake an Asian without relying upon mortal contrivances. In the distant past, King Thorden and his knights twelve fought and defeated Nidhogg. Though the victory cost them dear, they were rewarded with a great prize, the Dread Worm's Eyes, both of which have since been held in the Holy See's safekeeping. The eye you possess was Nidhogg's left, and long has it served as a source of the Azure Dragoon's might. As for its twin, It has lain here, joined to the person of Haldroth, the first Azure Dragoon. For though he learned to harness its power, he was ultimately consumed by it. Even in death, his body decays not. A pitiful end for a fabled hero. My Asian friend, long have you and your kind sown the seeds of chaos by teaching mortals the secrets of summoning. But if you assumed that we would meekly serve as your pawns, then you are gravely mistaken. You would raise a hand against us. By taking unto my flesh the soul of the legendary King Thorden, I am become a god! not cessation, whose being is sustained by a millennium of fervent prayer, and the eyes nigh bottomless reservoir of ether. What? Your contempt for man has proven your undoing, Asian. For my first act as God King, I do hereby sentence you to die! Ether takes. Asian souls are no exception. 
With this power, I shall put an end to a thousand years of conflict. Sown by Asian, Dragon, or Primal, wheresoever the seeds of chaos threaten to quicken, I shall excise them with my divine blade and bring order to the world. Brothers, the time is come to call upon the true power of the Heaven's Ward! Fight me if you will, warrior of light. I care not. All who stand against me will be destroyed. Be they servants of the darkness, or the light. By my blessing shall all men be sanctified, and an endless era of peace begin. Vice and conflict shall cease to be. You reject my divinity, yet what have you to offer my people in its stead? Bitter truth, virtuous suffering, If you believe your cause just, I call upon you to defend it with your life! How can this be? A millennium of prayer and the eye's power combined? And still you stand! It is over then. I had hoped that mine would be the hand to end it. But knowing you, there was little chance of that.
It would seem the eye has served you well. remains is to take them beyond the reach of man and dragon both. With this task accomplished, my toil shall finally be at an end. God damn it, do you always have to cut it so bloody close? It would seem she has done it again. Was there ever any doubt? Let us return to Ishgard. Our friends will be eager to learn the battle's outcome and welcome back their champion.
Where is Justinian? I dare say you are the first soul in Ishgardian history to arrive in our city upon Dragonback. This scene shall be remembered for a thousand years to come. As we had feared, the Archbishop summoned the soul of King Thorden unto himself, and thence became a primal. But he and his knights are no more, thanks to the Warrior of Light. Your struggles are not yet over, mortals. Uh, whom do I have the pleasure? I am Midgard Sormer. I have journeyed with Hydaelyn's champion and observed her deeds in the conflict between man and dragon. Tell me, children of Thordon, do you desire peace? My people have committed unspeakable atrocities against dragonkind, even against our own. Would that we could undo these wrongs, but we cannot. Be that as it may, the future yet presents a chance to begin anew. Our nation has broken free of the shackles of a false faith, and Nidhogg shall lead his kindred against us no more. I doubt not that it will require much effort and perseverance, but is my belief that in time, Ishgard will again become a place where man and dragon may abide together in harmony. I shall remember thy words. Yet be warned, Nidhogg's soul liveth on. His unbridled rage hath claimed for its vessel the one thou callest the Azure Dragoon. Astinian. Doubt not but that Nidhogg will call out to his brood ere long, nor that they shall answer him. Steal yourselves, for the true test is yet to come. Come what may, we will never cease to believe. Upon the souls of they who have sacrificed themselves to pave the way for peace, we will never abandon our cause. A thousand-year war cannot be ended in a day. It may take generations. What thou dost begin, thy children must continue. Entrust unto them thy hopes and dreams, that peace may reign again and forevermore.
present attest that Sir Emmerich, acting on behalf of the Archbishop, has appended his signature. I do hereby declare that from this day forth, the Holy See of Ishgard shall once more be counted a member of the Eorzean Alliance. Let our nations move forward as one and stand united against the Galian Empire. For the future of Eorzea. For the future of Eorzea! There you are. Hmm. A noble monument to a noble soul. Orshafon can watch over all of Ishgard. It has been a long and arduous journey, and we have lost much and more along the way. Yet come what may, we must stay true to our purpose and press on. Right, you two. It's high time we got back to rebuilding the Scions. Which means we're going to need money and lots of it. So ends a glorious chapter in their tale. However, tumultuous days yet lie ahead for Ishgard. After a thousand years under the yoke of the church, the people take their first tentative steps into the unknown. And though they spy a glimmer of peace upon the horizon, Nidhogg's vengeful shadow yet remains to darken the way. Be that as it may, so long as the young commander of the Temple Knights and his heroic companions are there to guide them, the people may hold fast to hope. The hope that one day, true peace will return to Ishgard, and that man and dragon may live in harmony once more. Let the deeds writ herein never be forgot, that they may inspire generations yet unborn to strive ever heavensward.
so La Habrea and Igeom have fallen. Bested by mortals in their attempt to initiate the Eighth Rejoining, that they should be so complacent. And now it falls to me to deal with the consequences. Without intervention, the balance between light and darkness will begin to shift, placing our mission in jeopardy. Hydaelyn's champion has grown too strong. Her might encroaches upon the realm of gods. Equilibrium must needs be restored. The time has come for you and yours to join the fray. Warrior of Darkness. Remind me, why is there no rest for the righteous? Because they care, Master Garland. Of all the things they could have picked to play with, that's not a toy, you bloody fools, it's a primal! 